My name is uh, Dr Mike Howarth. I was at the BBC in the school radio department as a primary geography producer from 1974 and I left the BBC in 1996. And my first job was to take over a primary geography series and that was just the most wonderful thing. I was spending my time going out and most of the time and working with very clever people um, in the studio, um, you know, I, I, and that went on for for really for getting on for ten years. You know, I would be everywhere. I went to about I don't know three or four hundred places around England. Uh, I've got them on a map somewhere. And then uh, around about um, 19, uh, 1984, um, things changed a bit. I started to do nature series as well as the geography series. You know, pretty good at one job, Mike. Job, Mike, you mm -hmm. can do a bit more. So uh, I did the nature series as well, and we started doing using software and creating software to go with the programs, and all of that carried on uh, until my final sort of swan song, which was in 1992, to go to St Lucia and do a big series of programmes there. Uh, that was when things changed, when you were creating resources for the national curriculum. Still mm. great at work, interesting work, but you were doing it for the national curriculum. And then I moved on um, gradually to do uh, other things at the Open University based on software software design and interactive software and that's where i came out in uh, 1996 with um, uh, sponsored bbc phd on interface design for children right now before you joined the bbc were you in education yourself yes i was and in fact i'd just come out of college and i'll tell you what i met this guy hitchhiking and his name was dennis kemp he was a climber, he knew Joe Brown and people like that. And I was uh, going back to college in Portsmouth. He had his van full of, of Nikon camera gear and Kodak Instamatic cameras. And he was uh, Kodak's education officer. And once I saw uh, this equipment in his, in his van, uh, I got kind of quite interested because I was quite interested in photography and music and doing things like that. And he said, well, come down and see me. And he lived at Southwick, which is just along the, uh, the south coast there. And before I knew it, I was um, being invited to go to Peru with a Kodak award, which a grant, which I, I won. I mean, I filled, he, he didn't get it for me. And I found myself in Peru uh, in the Valley of the Incas with, um, with, with my tape recorder, my Philips tape recorder and a uh, Nikon camera and uh, various other gear. So I started off um, really uh, then going to the Institute of Education Regional Resources Centre. Now, this period, the heyday of, of school radio, happened to coincide with the growth of software in terms of slides and, and pamphlets and booklets. It's all to do with the development of of printing at that time and this guy called Baruna who came over from America to talk about active learning and learning with resources and so on and uh, we knew about him at the Exeter Institute and we just looked at his what he was doing and said well we're doing it already and that's when <laughs> that's when they said well uh, you better get out there Mike with your tape recorder and your uh, new uh, new new little cameras that you could print out immediately and and, and you know the, the tape machine that went on forever and was really good quality and so um, I, I not only did I go to Peru but I went to uh, to um, Iran went across the desert and I went to Tanzania as well so when I turned up at the Beeb to visit my senior geography colleague I uh, presented all of my slides and my tapes and uh, on his desk and he said well Mike this is really funny that you've come here he, uh, he looked at all the stuff and said you know we'll be in touch sort of thing because I really wanted to sell my material we went down the back stairs in three portland place and there was a, a notice board and he said now mike i think you ought to maybe apply for this job the producer 
who d was doing this job has had a heart attack and unfortunately he's he's died and he said whatever you do don't use teachers all right it's not that they're useless and anything like that but they don't have the time he tried to get teachers to do the broadcasts and he paid for it unfortunately with his with his life because the job became so incredibly stressful so i thought well okay i will apply you know i was only what 23 at that time um I had so near misses in on the roads in peru i've been pushed around with guys with rifle in, 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 in Tanzania. In fact, I escaped, left from Tanzania. This is doing material for a geography <laughs> O-level school book uh, while the police were hunting for me and I was taken away. You know, I had five minutes to throw all my gear in and we went out the back door and as we were leaving on the front door, the uh, police were arriving to um, to question me. So by comparison, uh, schools radio was was a doddle. Uh, well, it, it it wasn't. It certainly wasn't a doddle. And uh, in fact, uh, my interview was very very uh, thorough and tough. But but in fact, what's happened is that since I've left, and in fact since 2019, I've been interviewing my colleagues and trying to find out just you know what. What was going on at that time? Because we never had time to talk to any to each other. It was so busy. And why did I get the job? And I got the job not only because I could survive <laughs> physically, but I was making programs with a camera. And I think this is something that uh, it's not special to me. All my colleagues were making radio with um, activities, um, music, art, people like Paddy Beachley, were, I went to her house recently and uh, filmed inside her house. The whole house is like a museum of school radio with all the artwork she did. All the producers weren't making radio broadcasts. They were, they were making teaching materials, teaching yes. resources. It started off quite simply. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you did your um, 30 broad broadcasts um, and then you, you're on a production schedule. You know, it's a publishing house. Then you had each term for 10 broadcasts, you would have a pamphlet for the teacher, teacher's mm -hmm. notes. So there'd be a 10,000 words. You have seven, seven days to write that, seven days to write 10,000 words on the schedule. And that had to be absolutely perfect with ideas and, and activities and references and things like that. Then you had the pupils pamphlet. Now that was 36 pages. And that was full of photographs, uh, diagrams, artwork uh, and then on top of that you'd have a radio vision which is uh, 36 slides now that continued to around about 1984 when suddenly the door opened and somebody said well uh, mike you know you're quite interested in in, in computers you know uh, uh you know you seem to know a lot about this stuff you've been fiddling around with all this equipment um what about some software to go with your geography and this was happening with not just me, but other producers. So you have that to do as well. Writing computer software. Uh, well, I, I knew how to do basic, um, mm. but because we had the, the BBC micros were being were coming in, in at that time, round right about that time. And yeah. next door, there was Arthur Viles. Oh, yes. Making programs for the computer literacy project. Yes. Yeah, and, and they were they were making little gadgets, little technical gadgets, uh, apparently as well. I mean, I never had times really to talk to them, but the BBC Micro came in, and I started to use this for writing scripts straight away. And then I, I had this gadget called a Husky Hawk. I mean, I, you know, you, I wasn't given any of this gear by the by the BBC. You, you know, you more or less had to do it yourself. So I was, mm. uh, you know, I'd have all my Nikon gear, and I'd have. Um, well, I get my Nagra or whatever in stereo and so on, but to get a, a computer, uh, they were, the beat was quite slow. And I had this thing called a, a Husky Hawk. It was like palm sized. And it, you know what it had? It had 12K of memory. <laughs> but this, <laughs> this allowed me to go out in an afternoon, go on location, go to all the places where the audio was being recorded, um, plan the photography as well, go back to the hotel, mm. write the script in the evening, print it out, and then my presenter, who is a chap called Timmy Mallet, uh, and the brains, uh, a, a lecturer, a teacher, a teacher of, of, of nature stuff as well, because I was doing nature as well as geography, mm. they'd come along and we would uh, f make the program in, well, usually just after lunchtime, 
the whole thing would be in the can with no links in the studio at all. Mm -hmm. And I really have spent my time on headphones listening in the foreground and the background as well, which is quite tiring. You can do it for a while because they're all stereo programs while um, taking the photographs as, as well. How many other producers within schools were actually interested in expanding the interactivity they were offering the schools? Well, I think in general, everybody was on their toes all the time. And I, I mean, if, if people thought that, you know, a school radio producer had all this power and everything like that, well, I mean, it was basically, you know, you might have had a class of, 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 of you know, 30,000 or something like that spread out in front of you in the classroom, in your virtual classroom. But you'd have a whole load of people behind you, you know, it would start from the head of department right the way down to your secretary, you know, who would raise her eyebrows if she didn't think of the thing was quite right, you know. So you, you, you were operating um, under all of this help and guidance and everything was open, everything you did. And I did a lot of, I did a lot of narration as well. So, you know, they were watching me in the studio like, like a hawk. But it was all to do with activities and learning. And the, the child was the focus. I imagined that I had a child sitting on my shoulder when I was outside and, and, and I was be making, trying to assure that this child had got all the language, all the feeling, all the sensations of being out on the road, you know, um, exploring for themselves. So let me just get this clear. You were you were taking your photographic equipment at what, out on location while you were also recording audio, but you were taking stills were you from uh, from your cameras to illustrate the material you were recording by uh, with the audio yeah absolutely and obviously i wasn't i wasn't taking the pictures while the camera's rolling or when any of the, vi the vital points were there but yeah. what i tried to do was well I, I call it 23 millimeter thinking because i always use the 23 millimeter camera which is kind of like wide angle and when whenever you put that into the scene you know, I would have someone looking at the camera and he'd be the person um, or the, the, you know, whoever it was, lady or whatever, would be in the centre of the picture, but the child could see the background. And so they, they, they had the, per actually, if I got it right, you know, there'd be somebody like a, a park warden on location. He gets a call on his walkie talkie. Um, the, the audio is rolling and I take a picture of him answering the, the phone and, 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 you know, that goes in the picture on the page where the student uh, pupil is looking at and it's filling their visual view. You know, they're big pictures spread across two pages and they're having an audio visual experience. Same with the other producers, you know, they had artwork and poems and songs to sing and everything like that. We were really, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of uh, a kind of a holistic learning experience. Who was uh, advising you about educational techniques, as it were? Well, we had virtually everybody you could think of. Um, I personally would have the Geographical Association and I would go along to Saturday meetings at my own expense to go along and meet the primary panel, tell them what I was doing and so on. We'd have uh, the School Broadcast Council advisors telling us about things that ought to be done. We had the county advisors, you know, it was open house. And, and this all started, you know, pretty open and free until round about um, when the national curriculum came again, came in again, which was round about, well, 1995, along that time, until then the door opened and, and somebody said to me, right, Mike, you know, you're going to do this. So we lost all of our excitement and and freedom, if you like, to get the right material, not our material, not personal material, but um, the right interesting and activity, active based learning. And it something changed then. And, and uh, I, we all turned into sort of making resources and um, things like that. So it was it got a bit boring. However, the software was growing. I was doing geography, you know, climbing Mount Everest with Chris Bonington as a game across the desert and other things like that. And then we even did a one thing on, started to do, I started to do nature programs. 
and we even did this thing called bird spy which was um, i thought it was rather nice it was in the blue peter garden but it all happened in school radio the software was used in the you know they said it was all their thing but it was actually school radio and that happened a lot of the time you know there were there were people who said oh i, I can't you know what, what are you doing why why you know i'd be doing um six programs on europe because i'd done a, a deal with a, a travel company a children's travel company and i had the joy of going on six coaches with six lots of children which i can tell you is is a living nightmare of dedication to to everything especially when you've got a french teacher feeding the driver snails um now that was quite an experience but but it, you know it was adventurous and we, yeah. we we were making all of this work all of this this material work for yeah. for for children and it, and it, and, it, and it really did work and you know there was douglas coombs and douglas coombs he used to fill the who did a music producer, he used to fill the uh, Albert Hall, uh, I think once a year. And I mean, he's still going now. I live in Hertfordshire and yeah. he does these battle proms. I don't know, he must be 90 odd. You know, you've got a whole orchestra, you've got your Spitfire flying over, you are active activity battles and so on. And I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people at Hatfield House, it's just extraordinary. And, and this was the kind of uh, mentality we had was, you know, we need the very best for the children um, of England because we were going to 90 percent of schools. The peak, 114, 114 programs, 90 percent of schools. Mm. Yeah, very powerful. Now, did, how much did you get out into the classroom yourself to see how these things were were being received? Well, you'd have to uh, go out quite regularly. It was all part of the training. As I say, it's all, all of these eyes are looking at or listening to you. And it is quite amazing being in the classroom um, with, you know, 30 children and he hearing your programme come out and fill the room. I must say, one of the most amazing uh, things that I noticed, by the way, that, I mean, that obviously, just let me just before I say that what I want to say um you know theory, you you've got to be academically correct the activities the subject matter had to be exactly what was needed and that was reported back by the teacher you know you you, you the children would tell you things as well and uh, you know it was it was uh, you, if you made a mistake you got into serious trouble and I only did it a couple of times I think I used somebody who had a, too too much of a, a plummy accent, and the other time is that I called um, the vacuum cleaner a Hoover, which ah, is seen yes. as advertising. Yeah. The thing I wanted to say, which is really really uh, mind boggling, I think, is you know the teacher used to say, "You can you can come and sit up here, Mr. Halleth. Uh, we, we we want you come sit here by me." So I'm looking at the audience, I'm not at the back, I'm looking at the audience, the children, and you have never seen so much eye movement in your life. The eyes are whizzing all over the place. And I, later on, I've done, I did a, a PhD, actually sponsored by the BBC. So I have been in Santa's Grotto, where, <laughs> as, dressed as a gnome, I have to say, tell you, with, with, the, with, the, with the fairy. Um, while the control, which is Father Christmas, is asking the child, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? Over and over again. And you watch their eyes move as they access or dream the, the, the things that they're hearing about or thinking about. And I think there is, I think they call it NLP. I'm not entirely sure. But I mean, I think people really might like to consider what has been lost with this uh, uh, schools experience mass listening in schools where children are just disappearing into another world and imagining uh, uh, imagining things in their minds so I, I think it's extraordinary and that that certainly gave me a, a, a boost you know I thought well, right, I'm doing that, the right thing that's a very interesting <laughs> issue which is which is more powerful um, schools radio or schools television 
What's well, I, I think they're both they're both equally um, important. And I mean, now I'm using it. I've got a news camera now. I'm using it all the time. It really is important. It's become very important uh, during lockdown. Uh, all the students I, I work with now, because I'm now in HE, um, at Middlesex and um, the University of Hertfordshire, and all the students. You know, I've been well. I've been talking to students in it, looking into my camera as a webcam for two years. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 you know, cameras and, and, and all of the visual side of things is really important. I just think that possibly for a younger child, it is all of the extra side rather than just sitting passively. But of course, you know, children's TV now is just just a wonderful thing. And I can't be too critical about it. But mm. there's, um, there's, there's room for both. I think. But you were you were there in a sense at the peak of schools radio, but also you went on to see it decline. I mean, first it went into the middle of the night and then it went uh, all together. That's right. You know, I mean, I'm looking down my timeline, which I put together. Um, night Nighttime broadcast came in the 80s. Um, I think it was uh, and so on but yeah. in in a way it, i seem to sort of manage quite okay i went to radio oxford in 1979 and i met this guy called timmy mallet who was doing children's programs and he came over and he was um he started i don't know whether it was i brought him to london or anything you know producers like to talk this this sort of way but it, 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 he he came to london I gave him some work working on the on the programs because he brought this humor and this fun. And then next minute, he, well, we're all, we're all, we're out recording and he says, I'm going to buy a big mallet. It's going to be made of foam and I'm going to whack people over the back of the head. We were walking along like a couple of kids. We were like a couple of kids waiting for the high tide. We're doing a recording on the beach. Uh, and, and, and I said, that sounds like, that sounds like quite a good idea. But I said, he said, I'm going to whack them on the head when they're right, not when they're wrong. You know? and, and, and next minute he was doing breakfast, breakfast TV. And I, and I took my daughter over to see him and um, Annika Rice was there and, and, you know, he was he had this parrot on his shoulder and so on. So he was doing that during the day and then he'd come and do the programmes for uh, for me. And then at a certain point, I think he got he got too famous and uh, he we moved on. But at that time, I was um, I don't know whether the name Terry Marsh comes to mind, but I had a meeting with her and I don't know how it happened. I think we all got moved to White City, which was very unpleasant. If you're a, a radio producer, um, I, I mean, I don't mind um, open plan offices, but when you really need to listen to two speakers, you know, eight foot apart for your livelihood, I didn't like having uh, not being able to do that in those open plan offices. But anyway, T Terry said, Mike, you're, you're interested in all this software stuff and you've got this com computer and you'd use it for making the programs outdoors and so on. Um, can, can, can you can you do some research? So I got my first job was to do a research on all the new DVD material that came in. And I analyzed that and, you know, bought it in and had a budget and so on. And then at the end of that, I don't know, I just don't know how it happened. Terry, Terry said, well, Mike, you know, we need you to make some interactive material. Um, there's a, there's a, a radio series called Starcatcher. It's very successful children's music series. Um, go away, go to the Open University, to the multimedia unit there and um, make something. So mm -hmm. I went to the Open University and there was a, a bunch of people there. Uh, I'm looking down my my list of things. Mm. Um, and we made the first CD-ROM, which was a catalogue. That was amazing. The catalogue yeah. has to be drawn out. And there was a big room with bits of paper stuck together on the floor, a large room with the branches for the different clips to be played that was that was really quite something and then i did a, a a dvd version of the open university academic staff briefing film called the tortoise and the hare mm -hmm. and um, and you know well it went on from it went on from there and yeah. i asked could i do a phd to develop 
the project and do an academic study of it and yes. that's what I continued to do and that was the tool that you you know was an interactive version where the kids can move things around that was shown at Broadcasting House and I think people were very very interested that was the kind of the first interactive hand eye body involvement with a mouse with a computer yes. screen that, tell, tell me a bit well, more about well. that that sounds very intriguing uh, could you be more um, specific about what what the kids were actually doing and seeing and hearing well mm. it was a music series therefore uh, and there's a story of a star catcher who went went out and with a big net and so on so there was this is the thing about school radio you already had the resources you had the artwork which could form the back of a computer screen mm. uh, we adapted various things to make it sort of more 3d the activities that a child might do, say, on a xylophone, play a tune for Starcatcher, uh, was actually on the screen. And this is all sort of if-then coding and so on. Now, I yes. wasn't doing the coding, but I did know the basics of it. I wouldn't want you to think that I was actually doing all the programming. We had uh, some good students uh, from Middlesex University who, mm -hmm. you know, I... I been with them, seen them, and sort of knew them quite well. So they were getting the contract to create the interactive products. And that was wonderful. I mean, that's the basic of basis of all the games that you see at children that children are using at the moment. In fact, it's mm -hmm. it's if then or um, you know, click on one and something else is revealed or a sound is played and so on. Mm -hmm. And there was a you know, I had about five games and each of them had a different technique like you had to move something from somewhere else you had to move the stars or you had to play on the stars and various other things it's um it's in my phd you can read it <laughs> read all about it if you've got enough time now was this material produced and, and distributed by by the bbc or by the open university it, it, in the end uh, that that was finished actually after i left that there was a sort of funny goings on in the Open University, I don't know how to describe it really. I mean, I, I was doing all of this work, um, but the Open University wanted to do um, this sort of work and the television producers wanted to do this sort of work. And frankly, nobody really wanted. Well, I thought I felt nobody wanted to was, was listening to anybody in, in school radio because still school radio was then being cleared out. At that time, while I, while I was doing this work, um, 30 of us were, were leaving. And in fact, I was the very, very last person to, to, to leave for various reasons I don't want to talk about. Um, but it, 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 it's, it was um, a great adventure. It really was. Uh, I mean, I should say that, you know, even in these sort of dark hours of producer choice and you know where you don't have any choice at all I mean that was just amazing it was incredible to to live through that my last series was and we're going back now to 1992 was to do um, resources for and this is what it was you made resources for the national curriculum so I went to St Lucia they put me on a course to, to see whether I could do outdoor broadcasts and things even though I'd you know done it for 20 years this is all part of the kind of softening up uh, the process for leaving, you know. Um, and anyway, I went off and I managed to do 10, 10, 10 recordings, broadcasts recorded in, in 12 days. And I ever, only ever sat on a lounger for about five minutes in the whole of the time I was there. But I managed to do all the photography and, uh, oh, incidental tale. I have a thing about helicopters. Helicopters and I, don't really go but they're a fantastic geographer's tool but i mean i nearly fell out what fell out of one at raf cold rose with uh, doing a air sea rescue thing and then I, I, I was at round island lighthouse first of all we got stuck there for a week instead of just going for the day because the weather was so bad and when they got the helicopter we, we had two seconds to get in the helicopter we got, before it got blown off the heli helicopter pad and we just went off forward and the, the pilot corrected things and um, I think in St Lucia that was the last limit when 
I was doing an aerial view of the whole island and then linking it to all the places I'd been. And I was, the side of the helicopter was open, open and we were on the, on the helipad and I just see this movement on the side and the petrol bowser is moving towards the helicopter because somebody hasn't put the brakes on. So I tapped this guy on the shoulder pretty right and he just lifted the helicopter up off the ground while the bowser rolled across where we'd been. Otherwise, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be telling the tale. <laughs> <laughs> but nowadays, of course, you would use a drone or something like that. I of imagine. course, of course. Uh, I mean, I'd had lots of adventures. I've been so lucky. Um, I used to live at uh, Nebworth and the gardener at Nebworth was a guy called Mike Calnan. And we got friendly and uh, I did some photographs for him. And uh, actually, I was going to work one day and he said, I said, he had his portfolio in the tube station. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm going for a job at the National Trust as head gardener. And he got it. And then 1987, come the big storm. He said, Mike, do you want to go into all the uh, helicopter records? Uh, I spent two days in a helicopter going round the uh, country houses south of London that have to document the the big storm and after two days of this I can remember um, somewhere in Elstree it parked up in a in a little chef or something like that and I just kind of more or less passed out um, and this guy knocked on the on the window and said are you are you okay and he said you look as if you're dead and, and the problem with being in the back of a helicopter for such a long time is, is you start to get hypothermia. And this was something that I really I was right on the edge of. Now, fortunately, I'd stopped to go to sleep and, uh, and recover. But uh, helicopters and I, they're very useful. But I think a drone... Oh, and, and that's the point. The point is my mate, Mike Kalman, now has a drone business. So he doesn't need me anymore, but he is going around doing all of these surveys with this super drone that he's got, well, which is just as well. <laughs> so there we go. I was just wondering how much the, uh, the teaching of geography has changed in the last uh, 10 years, 20 years, because of things like climate change and all those things that uh, are geography in a sense, but also uh, meteorology and various other things that I suppose you would consider part of geography yeah I can't really say uh, about the senior geography because I only did primary geography uh, all I can say is that there was a kind of always was a, a high eight a kind of shift between 1974 was the first kind of um, uh, environmental studies you know I actually trained as an environmental studies teacher it yeah. was all to do with the built environment and improving things and Colin Ward uh, was the big hero for uh, uh, environmental teachers who are wishing to bring geography into something a little more sort of relevant uh, but there was always a tension throughout all of the time I was making those programs between formal geography physical geography and human geography and other sides of things which is to do with the environment I mean I, I had breakfast with Jack Cousteau in I think it was 19, 1986 with uh, 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 and and he, I wanted him to talk about the little beautiful scenes down below, you know, sorry, I'm not doing very well, but he flatly refused to do this because he said it's all dead down there. I mean, that's in 1986. Really? And uh, a lot of the things um, the children knew about it because we were doing pro programs about all of that kind of as aspect. I mean, Luton Who, I did the first program about the hedges being stripped out because they just stripped out the hedges uh, at a big country house farm um, near at, at Luton. I mean, there was the, that famous um, Silent Spring. I just forget the lady's name. But I mean, that was um, the, our sort of subject matter for, 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 for that sort of work. And it's taken, what, 30 years for the reality to um, hit home? Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly hitting home now. So when yeah. you, when you we, left the BBC, you took all these uh, interests and abilities with you and you've done your PhD. Yes. Um, so what did you do then? Well, I, I, if I could just sort of leap forward to now, and it's really has, has happened since from 2019 when, when 
uh, Stephen Barclay came to see me is that during lockdown I have been looking back at all the skills that I was taught as a teacher at the Beeb. I'm putting them on my website and demonstrating what we did to make online teaching valuable during Covid. Now of course I've done all of this work and it's now back to the classroom and I think that um, that it's even more useful all of these things because these I think I've got about 12 particular skills um, uh, which was all teachers use but they're kind of supercharged for distance working on the distance you know I mean I'm not just talking to you you know I am just putting on a little bit of extra you know and you have to do this to 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 communicate with students I think even if you're in HE and things like this so what I've been doing really since I just walked straight out of the Beeb I went to Watford I thought I'd get, go back to FE see and I sat down and, and the guy said, he looked up from my CV and he said, when can you start? We've got an HND in multimedia. Uh, uh, can you set the whole thing up? Uh, we've got, you've got about six weeks. And of course, you know, yes, you know, I can organize anything standing on my head, more or less after 20 years at the Beeb. So I had, I had a, a lot of fun doing that. And then um, the, the college had a financial problem, so we all had, we all got booted out. Um, so I went to Middlesex, where I did my mm. PhD, and they they said, well, um, well, actually, a guy said to me, he said, well, you're from the BBC, aren't you? Well, can you do us some videos? So I thought, I smiled sweetly and said, uh, oh, cool, yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem. So I, I I beetled off, and I I I had a real top class presenter called Astley Jones and his son is a, a, a competent ca cameraman over in Wales I think he's doing all sorts of stuff and he said Mike go and see John Morris now I don't know who John Morris was but I phoned him up and I went round to his his place and uh, he, he said well you know I have all top management in here and this thing so he's, he's retired long long time ago he was the first guy uh, in the Stasi, Stasi headquarters um, at the fall of uh, fall of the Berlin Wall or something like that anyway and, and he gave me some really good uh, f proper news journalist treatment and halfway through this I, I suddenly realized boy you know I'm having to rewrite this stuff to talk in front of the camera set all the lights up and everything else and he said but this is like a an Oxford Cambridge tutorial not that I've actually had one but I'm guessing it was like that and um, rewriting can you say that again please would you like to just rephrase that uh, for the spoken word well that's just what goes on uh, in uh, in academia you know student writes an essay in his head spoken English and you uh, en encourage to do it in written uh, English you know in not, not in a sentence with three lines long with the key word at the end, but you put the key word or the key idea at the beginning and have some, you know, subject, verb, object. Um, so I got really interested in this and I think this is the biggest possible benefit of working in, in school radio is this kind of multimodal state of in spoken English, you know, because you'd be doing the scripts, you know, you'd be walking around in the office speaking out, you know, kind of childlike uh, evocative language and next minute in the afternoon you'd be writing, writing about the same prose, subject yes, exactly. in, in, in perfect clean English yes, not a single yes. mistake at all yes. and um, this is what I'm sort of encouraging uh, uh, HE lecturers to uh, look at and, yeah. uh, and and pick up and and you know it's a shame really that as I understand it school radio has has you know has been parcelled mm. off and, and moved off uh, when the children I think what was going on with the children was that they were being transported in their mind somewhere and they were comparing what was in their mind with the words the formal words and the pictures of the real place mm. on their paper and that was the kind of beginning of being in the world actually being in the world and there is some evidence for this because there's a philosopher called Wittgenstein who talks about the window and talks about clearing the fog and uh, you know what did he with, do with children 
you know, he used to boil cats and dead cats and look at the bones and, and take them on hikes and, and do all of the things that, you know, it's called active learning now. You know? Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's yes. a funny thing like that. But those, that's the sort of general, general way of the time working at the moment. And there yeah. isn't basically still a dull moment as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, Mike, is there anything you want to sort of finish with about the BBC? I mean, your general impressions of it, how it's changed? Well, there are, there are a couple of things that I, I would like to know about. Um, where, where, or the significance of them, because when I was, let's talk about the end, the, the end of, of school radio, it was clear. Yeah. I was at the Open University, I was still working on my PhD, I was still doing these other jobs with the Open University. And this guy um, came in the room in a sharp suit and looking very smart, very young. And he said to me, he said, um, he said Mike, I understand that you, 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 know, you, you know about this thing called PowerPoint. I mean, nobody knew what PowerPoint was, but I mean, but essentially, you know, the, the film strip that school radio have been using since 1953, you know, with thousands of these, and there's a, a thing on YouTube about it. So I, I could, I knew the software, it's very erratic and didn't work. And I, I actually bought my own laptop. Now, at that time, there was, nobody really knew what a laptop was. I'm guessing over, over egging it perhaps, but certainly they were very rare. And this turned out that this guy, hang on a second, I'm just, um, I'm just, sorry, I'm holding this, this thing in the hat, in my hand, it's a, it's a, it's a printout, I've got it down from the attic, it's the BBC Education 10 Year Strategy. Now this was a sort of interactive thing, like you just flip from one screen to the other, but it marks out the whole of the plans for BBC Education. Um, this is this is 1996. My job was to get this looking smart and looking interesting and laid out correctly. And it was going to be put on a laptop and every board of governors member was going to get this laptop. And if this was being organized by KPMG. Well, basically, I did read it and it, and it was yeah. essentially to say the BBC will no longer uh, support uh, cradle to grave education so my whole experience at the beam was going to was going to stop school radio was one part of it but it was kind of the bbc's attitude to education and i i'm slightly concerned that that it wasn't so much about john burt it was about american um american business methods being um, inflicted on the bbc but i, I don't know whether, whether that's the case really say la vie yes Say la vie indeed. Well, look, uh, Mike, thank you, thank you very much. I think that was an extremely interesting uh, account. Well, it's been a pleasure, really, and uh, as I say, it's it's a privilege to have to have worked um, for the for the Beeb. You you got such a good training as a teacher that you could just walk off and go straight into um, a, a, the rest of your career without uh, batting an eyelid. Good. Well, thank you so much.